Religion, especially religious ritual, is a major source of enchantment. At the same time, there are theological obligations at work determined to tell you what it means. Discouraging unlicensed wonder and setting up permanent and universal truth as more important. The effect of such a program is necessarily disenchanting, so there is a tension at work in religion. We will look at how to negotiate it. I would tend to agree. I think those that people that approach religion and the sacred, um, although the sacred isn't, I should mention, the, sac the sacred isn't necessarily synonymous with wonder, of course. Uh, those people that approach religion from a more sensitive and layered perspective will tend to see it as both enchanting and disenchanting. Religion can tell us how to live. It gives us purpose in life. It fundamentally affects how we go about our day to day. Religion is best, I think, from my narrow limited perspective here, it's best when it's not looking at codification and programmicity, when it's not dealing in abstract truth, as the description said. Religion at its worst, I would say, um, comes largely from the world-denying aspects, especially in Christianity. Since I was perhaps a teenager, I always had a very deep distrust of Christianity. I actually, I, I found Christianity to be the source of most of the world's ills. Uh, my opinion on that, on that has changed drastically. I still very much, I still very much hold a negative opinion of the Christian Dominion thesis. Perhaps I will, I will clarify later on, but religion, when it's mired in a sense of anthropocentric striving against the world in favour of something higher and better, a stepping stone to something higher, that's where religion goes wrong, I think. So just to keep things broad, um, I will look at two branches here. And now I'm kind of retreading some uh, information I just discussed in my a previous video. But there are really two branches here. Religious supernaturalism and scientific materialism. Or put another way, theistic dogmatism on the one hand and secular notions of progress, secular mastery on the other. Both are disenchanting. Um, they both share the same drive, the drive towards control and manipulation. And people like Max Weber and Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer knew this, they really fundamentally are, are linked together. They are the two disenchanting monisms, as Curry would say. And this really all begins with Plato. Plato, I used to admire some of Plato's ideas, but more and more I found them to be, they really are linked with this world-denying view of things. Um, the, Plato denied he hated death, he scorned the world in favour of some abstract plane of ideas. He really was someone that is anti-enchantment in a sense. Of course, many, many Greek society, Greek beliefs, deeply enchanting for its polytheism, its veneration of nature, its focus on the, the, the nude figure, that kind of vigorous vi vitality at the heart of, of the Greek uh, the Greek world, the Greco-Roman world even. But Plato is very sterile. It's very, uh, again, world-denying. Platonism, kind of transferred through Christian mysticism into what we know today as this really fundamentally earth-scorning, uh, worldview. People like Bacon and Descartes, uh, they strove to master nature. They strove to understand it and thereby control and manipulate it. They saw things as very being very mechanistic, deterministic, and they, they wanted to be God, essentially, to control things. Disenchantment, in, the, in a very broad sense, relies on an idea of a single way, a single truth, uh, one way of knowing. And for these early scientists, the naturalistic philosophy, it was to 
fully and comprehensively control the world. Now religion, religion at least, reserves a place for mystery. That's something I have come to appreciate uh, in religiosity generally, in the very vaguest, most vague sense. I always look towards science as being a, a way of affirming our animal origins. Science can help us understand that we are, of course, ecology, the study of relationships, it can help us be aware of our fundamental place as animals on this earth. We're no more special than any other animal. That's why I principally valued science and the study of ecology in particular. But over time, I've actually grown quite enamored of the the, 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 the non-anthropocentric aspects of religion. A lot of religion, and I didn't quite appreciate this uh, when I was younger, a lot of religious traditions and, and ideas point towards non-anthropocentrism as opposed to uh, a human-centered view of things, which, which and, and this is a, a tangent here, but the distortion of the scientific worldview combined with uh, uh, kind of hyper individualistic neoliberalism it's that 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 way leads to human centeredness i would much rather um i much I would much rather much rather be more sympathetic to a god that is unknowable that is that, that is so much greater than the human because it actually if it, it helps the human look out the human figure look outwards um, instead of looking solipsistically inwards so there is that at least so as with all things enchantment it really points towards a middle ground again kind of a third road um, and Curry talks about and this is not in the course but Curry talks about the third road of fairy this place that really is between these two disenchanting monisms. Um, and that's such a, it's such a fascinating th way. It's, the third way is the animistic way. Um, between religious supernaturalism and secular mastery through, again, that control, the manipulation of the world. And something that I find valuable in this way of thinking is that it avoids New Age spirituality. Not that I'm entirely against different, um, a, 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 a multiplicity of, of of beliefs and practices. Of course, that's that's what that's where enchantment thrives. But New Age spirituality, in the sense of um, overt self actualization, this idea of practicing a tradition solely for what it can give you and I think a lot of traditions in my understanding a lot of these traditions are, are highly focused on um, trying to understand the self through through ritual through magic practices through the occult and I've never really warmed to that kind of um, to those kind of ideas those kind of practices there's also something to be said for that, again, the Dionysian mode, where things become, uh, they meld together, they are, they are, so they strive for unity and there's no boundaries and everything is just a, a coagulation, a, a pure chaos. I, I find um, one association that springs to mind in relation to that is the very eclectic nature of a lot of New Age practices, uh, Wicca and so forth. Um, a lot of new age, um, a lot of new age ideas about spirituality are the very idiosyncratic. They take from here and there, and there's no sense of tradition and structure and community. So I think I may, I may, I might be applying Dionysian mode a bit incorrectly, but I feel, I feel like there's something there. I feel like there's something there, and something that is important to bring up in regards to. Earth-centered sacrality, valuing the earth from a more animistic, an animistic perspective, is 
as with enchantment, as, as we should know by now, enchantment isn't universal. And that is where ideas like Gaia sort of go wrong, in a way. As much Gaia has much to recommend it to the attributes and the kind of general outlook to, of enchantment. But Gaia implies a, a Gaian way, the earth as a kind of an earth religion, a single religion that values the earth and everyone must practice it in the same way. I, I would see myself as valuing a kind of a, a Gaian way, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish to be told how to express that. And so there is even something as, as admirable as respecting the earth can be twisted, as with all things in enchantment. It, it, it's all about relations. So, I have missed out, I've neglected to speak about a lot uh, that was mentioned in the course in that particular class. But I will just bring up a point of my own here, identity politics. Um, and this relates back to the Again, that hyper-individualistic hyper focus, uh, that kind of solipsistic, inward-looking mode that we seem to be kind of mired in nowadays. We have turned from religion, traditional religion, and our, we, we seem to be promoting the human figure above all else through this fascination with labels and identity and social justice to the exclusion of earth justice, be uh, justice for other being. So of course there is a lot that I've not discussed in this particular video that was mentioned in the class, but it's a very broad topic, very important and, and very uh, uh, contentious. But I hope that gives some idea of, of, of the way that enchantment really favours a middle ground, the kind of a third road. And uh, there is enchantment to be, to be found within religion. But a lot of disenchantment as well. I think it requires a, a quite a unique perspective to look at religion um, and, and take the best from it. Now, this kind of this uh, monotheism was later unevenly and imperfectly. By later, I mean starting in the seventeenth century, mostly um, secularized into a secular, a scientific idea of single material truth. In other words, the, the, the philosophy, not the science, but the philosophy of scientific materialism kept the idea of a single um, universal truth to which it had access. Uh, unlike non-scientists who don't, and uh, kept the idea of one, uh, not not got rid of the idea of God, but kept the idea of an ultimate value. So in science, in the philosophy, I keep saying philosophy because that's what it was. It wasn't a science. The philosophy of scientific materialism uh, uh, carried forward the assumption that there's only one thing worsh worth worshiping. That's the place that God had occupied. Uh, and that thing that's worth worshipping is scientific truth. And by the way, scientific truth is single and universal. There isn't room for more than one kind of scientific truth. So quantum, of course, played, played Mary Hell with this, but ultimately, ultimately didn't displace the, the mode. It could handle... Science, scientism could even handle quantum physics and its madness and its weirdness. That's impressive. Um, and, and the difference, I guess, I think the main difference then between uh, the monism of scientific materialism and the monotheism and monotheism, religious kind, is that even the strictest monotheism reserves a place for mystery. Because ultimately, why? Because ultimately, God is a mystery, or God is the ultimate mystery. We, limited, mere, mortal, limited human beings, cannot hope to plumb the mystery of God. 
I mean, that's a ridiculous idea as far as it goes. But the scientists say, no, the, sorry, the scientoids say, no, there's no ultimate mystery. It's all just a puzzle and we are figuring it all out. We will eventually figure it all out. We will have, we can have perfect knowledge, therefore perfect control. A very important reason, if not the main reason why I think people, some people anyway, become scientists because they are enchanted by the natural world, the wonder of the natural world and or some aspects of the one of the natural world. Every time you watch David Attenborough, he is radiating enchantment by by the natural world and it's in our fellow creatures okay but where the, but 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 where the licensing comes in the sort of analog of theological vetting is that the older teachers mostly will say to the younger students well that's great that's great that you had that experience and motive obviously it's motivated you very strongly to be here and but now you have to set that aside and grow up this is how it all really works. And then this will be the this of this is how it all really works will be a, a causal, a causal account, okay? Implying explanation, prediction, and control and manipulation, standing outside of the phenomena in the, particularly in laboratory context, saying, okay, we're going, to minute, we're going to change this gene in this way, and then we're going to see the effects on, on the gene of those changes in other respects, pure disenchantment. And also, scientists, when they write up their reports, what gets published is they are, in those reports and those accounts of what gets, gets published, enchantment has absolutely no place. It is not allowed in. Uh, and it's the disenchantment of monotheism and the hostility, note the hostility that monotheism entails, I would say even stronger than uh, implies, to what I think of as the sources or the wellsprings of enchantment, namely the body, although I prefer the term body-mind, which is a translation of, a, of a, an Eastern term, uh, I mean, a Far Eastern term, I think probably a Buddhist term, because it implies that the, when we say body, I don't, when I say body here, I don't mean it's pure, the purely material body as if there was such a thing, which there isn't. I mean, the minded body, the sub, a body as a su as subject, okay? That's one source of enchantment. The female, uh, for a whole set of reasons which I can't go into in 15 minutes. Um, but um, th there's a sense of a female maternal which is fundamental to life. It's described well in the, um, the best description I ever found of it. It's discussed a lot in feminist philosophy, but the best description is from the Tao Te Ching, uh, which talks about the dark female dark meaning mysterious, who gives birth to everything, including both men and women, and all the 10,000 things, as it's called, meaning everything, okay? So the, in, in that sense, the female is the source of enchantment and must be protected and valued. And thirdly, the earth, where it all comes, you know, where the, the source of life, the whole home of life on earth, you know, we say on earth, there's nowhere else for us to be on, on, okay? So the hostility of monotheism is precisely to the sources of enchantment. Why? Because those things are changing all the time. They're coming into birth. They're dying. They're passing away. They're flourishing. They're, they're decaying. They're, they're true. Here. Something's true here and not true there. Something else is true over there, etc., etc. All the things that Monism, philosophical Greek monism, was set up to reject as untrue. And then if you throw in Christian morality, they become not only untrue, but they become tainted, corrupt, etc. Okay? Whoa. 
I mean, the potential for disenchantment is profound. Let's talk now about the potential enchantment of um, Christianity. Because Christianity isn't just monotheistic. In fact, in some profound way, ways, it's not monotheistic at all. And that makes it of particular interest. First of all, I want to mention that St. Paul is not just this one-dimensional bad guy. Uh, Caritas, you know, his, his advocacy of love. There is a, uh, an honored place in Christianity to value and even worship the female through, through Mary and through understandings of Mary. That's pretty damn important. That's big. Thirdly, the Trinity. Um, I like the Trinity because my belief is that nobody understands it. It's, it's, it's really almost impossible to understand. But non nonetheless, you have this assertion that God is triune, is tri has, has a tri triple aspect, okay? Such that each aspect of the Trinity is God, but in a different way. And at the same time, perhaps a microcosm of all of them in its own way. God the Father, the, the ultimate spiritual being, the ultimate in spirituality uh, and spiritual reality and truth, incarnates in a human body and effectively becomes a human being, which is to say a limited, a vulnerable, a fragile being. So the ultimate reality becomes the most vulnerable and fragile being, a baby, not just a human being, but a baby, okay, who is completely helpless and dependent as babies are, as human babies are. That's an extraordinary metaphor, metaphorical leap. Uh, it's a metaphor because it's saying God is human and to be, by implication, potentially at least, to be human is to be God or God-like. Profoundly, potentially enchanting. I'm not sure if you're going to bring this up uh, later on. It's getting get, get near to the end of the talk. So I wondered if you're going to mention Ronald Hepburn at all. Um, I think it's a fantastic... Um, yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. It's this fantastic essay that he wrote, of course, and I've, I've, I've been aware of it um, from your own writing as well. And I just want to clarify, I just want to read a little bit, read a little bit here he says um he doubts there's a root of argument from wonder to god since to be evocative of wonder an object need not be seen as filtering the perfections of deity why well, what i love about that and I'm, I'm thankful to you in fact for actually bringing me on to hepburn um what i love about that particular sentence is that it seems to be quite soft it doesn't actually it doesn't exclude the idea it doesn't ex exclude the idea of god and quite no aggressive absolutist terms uh which is good but uh, at the same time it points again towards the imminent the downward and even the multiplicitous as well so i, I absolutely i keep reading it over and over again and it's just a, a wonderful um bit of language here i suppose yeah. i just wondered if you had any thoughts on hepburn's wonderful well, i mean i i i I'd, <laughs> I'd almost forgotten about about hepburn to be quite honest and he is wonderful. Just to explain to everybody, he's a pretty obscure uh, philosopher of aesthetics, English, who wrote a book which is long out of print, but I suppose you could still find it called On Wonder and Other Essays. Is that correct, Taylor? Have I got that right? That's correct, yeah. It yeah. should be correct, yeah. And, as, and what he says there, just to gloss what he's, the quote you, you read, he says, in, in effect, he says, you could invoke God, if you want to, as the source of enchantment or any particular enchantment, but you don't have to for it to be enchanting. It's not required. So Ronald Hepburn was more of a gentleman than I am. Uh, he, put, he, put it, he put it very discreetly that way, and that's a good way to put it. It doesn't exclude it, but he says you don't need to invoke. That's why... I sometimes describe, ex well, first of all, I have a huge problem with explaining enchantment because that's, that's 
you might as well say, my project is to disenchant it, enchantment, which is what, exp what explaining does in the sense that people mean it. You're, you're, you're accounting for its existence in terms of something else, which is more important or more real. Okay. So enchantment itself, yeah, not so important. And so I, I refer to neurophysiological or purely psychological explanations of enchantment as reducing down. And I describe uh, attributions of enchantment to God, which aren't that common. It's not that common actually, but anyway, as reducing up, um, still kind of a reduction, depending on how you do it, but potentially certainly still a reduction. Patrick, why do you think that Hepburn's essay um, has become so obscure for such a profound bit of writing? Because I, I know that it's, I had to, I had to find it um, via, I think it was the Open Library, and it's such an, it is an obscure work, but it's so, so fascinating. Well, it's a quiet work. It's an elegant work. It doesn't shout. It doesn't wave its arms about. Uh, you have to work to follow it. You have to have a little, you know, some degree of prior knowledge. The times are not hospitable to work like that. They just aren't. Uh, that's a gloomy assessment of why it's not better known. There's a lot of, there's an awful lot of great stuff that isn't very well known. <laughs> Uh, you know, perhaps part of our job is to bring it back, bring it out again. 